Life Audio. You're listening to Therapy and Theology, and I'm your host, Carly McClear. This podcast is a space where we explore popular topics and questions related to the convergence of faith, feelings, spiritual formation, and more. My prayer is that through these conversations, we will grow in our awareness of who we are as beloved children of God, learn to acknowledge our needs and emotions with curiosity and compassion, and rediscover the purpose and power of our unique stories through the lens of the gospel. As a licensed therapist and ministry leader, I want to give voice to the many questions we face while cultivating a clearer view of how our faith informs our healing journey. I don't have all the answers, but I am committed to going deeper and walking together. So whether you've been to therapy or know exactly what you believe when it comes to theology, I want to invite you to join this journey as we fearlessly name the complexities of our present reality and press into the hope of the gospel story. So are you ready? Let's jump into today's question and begin this journey together. Hey guys, welcome back to Therapy in Theology. Today we're back with the second part of a two-part series with David Rublet, and I'm excited about this episode as we dive back into the understanding of what spiritual addiction is and pathways for understanding embodied faith. So I hope you enjoy the rest of this conversation and be sure to subscribe to have each week's episode downloaded straight to your podcast. So we've been talking a lot about spiritual addiction, the impact, the effects it has on our spiritual and emotional well-being, this disembodiment that it creates. And we kind of ended off with talking about the misses of religious culture. So what would you say are some of the needs that are embedded within our spiritual addiction that need to be named and maybe even healed in light of the gospel message? Yeah, I love how Tim Mackey from the Bible Project talks about the fall. He talks about, he says, seizing autonomy. That's like the language he uses. We seize the autonomy. And so, and there's a lot that plays into that narrative, however you want to see it. But in that, there's a lot of things we can learn on how like the serpent pushes gaslights to to get to a point where humans are like, no, I'm no longer going to be in connectivity with God and kind of step out of that connectivity. And in that, there's shame that's brought on. We see them hiding from God. We see them turning on one another. And so I think that a lot of times, and this goes for any addiction and any struggle, is we need connectivity with God and with one another. Yeah. And that's exactly what we're made for. And I think that that's kind of the underlying issue. Now, how that plays out and where we walk from there. It looks different with every individual. We can't have the expectations necessarily that our anxieties are going to be gone right away. God might do that, but it's a journey sometimes that we have to walk of continually stepping into that space of saying, no, I'm connected with God. I'm connected with others. Yeah. Oh, that's so good. Earlier in the series, I talk about this connection between our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And I think this connects really well to that concept of just a whole body approach and yes. how that's how we were created. And we are like daily being renewed, right, to connect all of those pieces back. And I think that's so important. Going back to kind of the quote that I mentioned earlier in the last episode, to be alive is to be addicted and to be addicted is to stand in the need of grace. I think this can be mildly offensive, but I think it can also be really relatable. Just humanizing the idea of to be alive is to want, to long and then to be able to stand in the need of God's grace. And so I would love to hear your thoughts on grace as an antidote. Yeah, if I could pull back to, I'm going to hit just kind of a, a section of a few verses that we see, and it's in Romans 7 and 8. Paul's talking, he says, I do the things I don't want to do, you know, and the things I want to do, I don't do. You know, the things I know I should do, I don't want to. And he kind of cries out, you know, kind of this awareness of the fact He's wrestling and struggling. And once he gets to the very next chapter, he says, therefore, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so he hits this point. And then 
as you go through the whole rest of the chapter, it's cloaked in grace, 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 even to the point it talks about those whose mind is on the things that the Spirit desires are because they're following the Spirit. And if our mind is on what the flesh desires, it's because we're following the flesh. Now, that word flesh is a conversation around the, the hurts, habits, hang-ups, the struggles that he's talking about. And what grace does is it says, hey, I know that you're still struggling, but no. you're not condemned. And it says you don't have to focus on your management of your behaviors because when you do that, you're putting your mind on those things. Focus on the things of God and of the Spirit. And mm -hmm. as Galatians says, you will step away from indulging in those things. What grace does is grace offers us power when we don't have it. Grace offers us strength when we don't have it. But even when we do the things we don't want to do, you know, and we don't do the things that we know we need to do, it says there's no condemnation. And so it's kind of this whole part that steps in the gap and allows, I use the term, it says the pressure's off. Mm -hmm. And I think that a lot of people need to hear that, but you're not going to hear that unless you're like, man, I really want to experience grace. And what I love about things like addiction is when you surrender your will to a God who could do everything you can't do for yourself, you're stepping in and saying, hey, it's messy, but I want to experience grace as I walk. That's so good. I love that picture, that invitation, yeah. right? To like bring our mess to God, not get all cleaned up and then move to God. I also know from just an attachment perspective and a trauma reaction, right? Like that, that can be really challenging for people. So just naming yeah. that as you might be listening, that moving towards even something good can be really scary. And especially if you've grown up in religious cultures that have truly like created the template for our programming that says, you know, you can't, you know, or you have to be good enough yeah. or God only loves you when dot, dot, dot. And so I think there can be even grace for that, even space for that in the sense that we might need to take small doses yep. of just recognizing, you know, how do we move towards grace in little increments? And I think that's a beautiful way of kind of recognizing that it's available to us. You know, I don't know if you have anything to add. Yeah. To that. Brad Jerzak talks about, he says, the scripture says when perfect love casts out fear, the problem is, mm -hmm. is if our belief system and our practice is based on fear, what's going to happen is, hey. and what you're yeah. getting at is actually, we're going to be at a place of panic because everything that we kind of stood on as a foundation will kind of fall mm -hmm. away. And that's a reality that I love what you said about taking it in doses, because it can be disorienting when we come to the place where it's like, okay, even a step to walk in grace, walk in love and walk in freedom, that first step mm -hmm. for people who haven't experienced that and what they've learned and how they've practiced their faith, that's all been about doing better, trying and harder. Just that first step of experiencing mm -hmm. grace and freedom is disorienting because perfect love casts mm -hmm. out fear. Therefore, you're beginning to experiencing the love that's casting out some of the foundations mm -hmm. that you've walked in. Yeah. Yeah, it's a process for sure, but one that could be really healing for sure. I was just thinking of when you were saying that, I was thinking of a client recently that, you know, a lot of trauma happened in the church and, at, you know, you can maybe speak to this from your pastoral kind of experience, but even the church can be triggering. And so one of our conversations was like, I just feel so much guilt if I don't go to church. And yet going to church created even more distress for her. And so it was like, can you find God's grace? in not going to church, just just don't go to church this Sunday and just hold space for God is with you. He's not getting angry with you. You know, like this, it's so hard when we're disentangling trauma and even just like the, that religious culture that it can be so controlling to take a, one of my friends likes to call like a passive role. And I think that's sometimes helpful to go like, God is actively moving towards me and I can just rest. Yeah. And I don't know what that looks like for those listening, but maybe it's just asking, like, what can I let God do yeah. so I can just be? And that can be an act of, of grace. Yeah, some of that 
because you talked a little bit about some of the need for control. Some of that is in there. I think what I continually tell people and what I've had to experience for myself is that God's work is actually the prioritizing on the chain of God's work is healing. And so mm-hmm. if the practice that you feel like you should do is actually contributing to more pain, you don't need to pressure yourself. God doesn't want you to hurt yourself to walk in the doors of a church where you might be hurt again. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It's all about like healing those spaces first, and then we can figure out what that looks yeah. like. You know, it can look different for everybody. Yeah. And, good. and to that, if you don't mind me saying what some of the things that tends to happen when people are like, hey, I might be at a place where I'm ready, you know, to check out a church again. One of the things I encourage people to do is it might never look and it's okay if it might never look like it once did for you. Like it could be a community in a totally different way. And that's okay. Yeah. Well, thank you for adding that. As we kind of conclude, there's kind of two pieces here, but first what avenues do you find to be helpful for those either recovering from like this history, like, oh, I was brought up in this kind of culture of religious addiction. I thought that was like what was honoring to God and or like, what would you say is helpful for recovering from those that want to just increase their authenticity and their spiritual journey? Yeah, I think realizing that your emotions and your even mental health stuff you're walking through is real. One of the things with religious addiction, what it does is it's an attempt to bypass those things and you don't actually get to walk through them with the Lord. You're attempting to walk around them. And Christian culture has done a horrible job of helping us with us. Our uh, Christian radio is horrible. It only, you know, the songs on there only encompass about 2% of life experience And it's a really quick resolve. You know, it's something about a storm or water you're walking through. And then right after it's like, but God and every song has this quick resolve. And so we think that that is how faith works. But Mm -hmm. if you look at like Psalm 23, even though I walk through the shadow of death, you are with me. Mm -hmm. And when we need to heal and we experience things, grief loss, abuse, trauma, those sort of things. We are hardwired by God to walk through, you know, anxiety, to walk through if if we lost, you know, we go through denial and depression in that healing process. And we tend to oftentimes try to escape feeling those things. And so if I could just say one of the first things that I want to encourage people to do is not escape. Because when you want to escape, what it does is it pushes you into unhealthy coping, which could be religious practice. But the way forward is to kind of sit and walk in what you need to be sitting and walking through that's uncomfortable. Be aware of what your body's doing. Be aware of where those points are. I talk through so many people that feel like they're bad Christians because they're wrestling through anxiety, depression, denial, all those things that come with really tough stuff. Yeah. And I think that when we could learn to feel, we mm-hmm. could learn to heal in those spaces. So, yeah. Oh, I love that. That's so good. Yeah, those are great. Well, one thing I ask all of my guests on my podcast is just as we kind of conclude, what is one encouragement or practice that has been a resource to you? in this process of just embodying a faith that feels authentic and less about self-improvement and more about resting in God's love. Yeah, I think I stepped away from the self-improvement stuff a while ago when I realized just how stressful it was. But one of the hard things for me, Mm -hmm. because I was uh, spiritually abused, was stepping into like healthy practices. Because I'm like, I knew what practices that disembodied you or brought on shame or made you fake were. I mean, I was around people that, you know, prayed prayers or, you know, but then they hurt people, Mm -hmm. whatever it was, I was around that. And so what I did was I actually got a spiritual director to actually kind of help me in places and in spaces that I didn't know or feel comfortable with. 
And one of the things in that that has been really helpful for me is looking into some of the practices of the desert mothers and fathers, which are some of the same type of practices. It's really funny when people who don't understand kind of being embodied and different types of prayer outside of what they've kind of learned, you know, in like evangelicalism and fundamentalism, they think you're getting into like Buddhism and like Eastern practices. But I've learned how much body movement and breath play into my connectivity with the Lord. And so if I can give one or two examples in this that have been really helpful for me is like when we pray at the end of kind of a spiritual direction meeting, I'll put my hand on my heart, start hearing it beat and wrap my hand around my shoulder in a sense of feeling safe and allow myself to breathe there are centering prayers that I've learned over the years. Some of them I think could dysregulate people because of some of the ancient language. But one of the things that I borrowed from Danielle Strickland, that's been huge for me, I hold my anxiety like right here. Different people, oftentimes it's in their stomach. They hold it. I feel it here when I'm anxious. And so one of the things that I've learned is if I'm utilizing the physical nature of feel my heart, feel my breath, And I breathe, and as I breathe out, I speak, you are loved. I think what it's done is it's, and I could speak to those places in my body, I could speak to myself. What it's doing is it's a moment of prayer, it's a moment of breathing, it's a moment of physical nature that actually reminds me that I have what I feel like I need when I'm trying to control and cope. And so that's mm-hmm. one of the practices that has been really big for me is feeling that since I feeling the physical nature, sometimes I'll go do the same thing while walking. So it's like it's that same contemplative deal, but then I'm actually moving. Mm-hmm. But when I feel the physical nature of what I need to feel to feel present and I'm aware of my breath, it allows me to practice a moment with God in a way that I think I didn't have before and I struggled because I was already disembodied and I had only learned how to pray in a way that wasn't actually bringing about a wholeness of healing in that moment. So, yeah. Awesome. That's so good. Thank you for sharing those. Well, I also just thank you so much for your ministry. For those listening, please go check out David on Instagram and you have a website. Any other things that we can kind of point people to? Yeah, Instagram's probably where I'm talking the most. Uh, Facebook, I mean, they share a lot of the same posts. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, David. I really appreciated our conversation, and I'm thankful for your ministry. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much for tuning in to this episode of Therapy and Theology. If you have a question or topic you would like discussed on a future episode, please feel free to email me or drop it in the comments. Also, don't forget to subscribe to have each week's episode instantly downloaded to your podcasts and see the show notes for resources mentioned in this episode. To access more content and join my monthly email list for the latest updates and info, visit my website at carlymarkwilliard.com.